with us is uh, Ms. Andrea uh, Herman from Canada and the United States, and uh, I hope we see us now better. Andrea, great greetings Hello. from Slovenia. Hello, we see you. Uh, we expect your work. Uh, you are a very strong girl in the world, <laughs> in the chem world. And uh, so please start it, talk about it, about your work, about your uh, about your plans, and so what's going on in the United States and Canada? Please take your place. From Canada and the United States. And, uh, Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I was getting a little bit of bad feed from having the streaming video. Hello from Canada. It is around 4.45 a.m. here, so the sun will be rising soon, and it's so nice to be able to be part of this online World Global Congress, being able to bring us all and as my title says, him united from a field to product, because that's what we're all about. So next. I'm going to run through these slides. You will be able to view them all with the video later as part of the World Hymn Congress. I want to give a big thanks to the entire team for bringing us together. So next slide. In February... As most of you know, last year, the Agricultural Act of 2014, the U.S.'s Farm Bill, Section 7606, brought forward legitimacy in industrial hemp research and further defining industrial hemp and allowing institutions of higher education and state ag departments to start cultivating hemp in research pilot programs. Next slide. In addition to that, we had two more bills, acts that were brought forward. Those were part of the Commerce, Justice, and Science Appropriations Act. And these are what controls the budget for the Department of Justice and essentially the DEA. And these two acts that got became part of 4660 essentially said that the Department of Justice and thus the DEA were not allowed to use funds to contravene Section 7606. This was really important. So this really brought the DEA on board and aligned the Department of Justice with the Farm Bill. Next slide. Currently, we have HR 525 and S134. These are the Industrial Hemp Farming Act of 2015. These two bills, one in the House and one in the Senate, would exclude hemp from the definition of marijuana under the Controlled Substance Act and then allow growing and processing of industrial hemp to be implemented under state law. So H.R. 525 and S-134 are in the United States' as Congress. So we are encouraging everybody in the United States watching to please go to votehemp.com, go up to that Take Action tab, take action and ask your legislators to co-sponsor these federal bills. Next slide. So there's a new amendment act that has been put forward in the Commerce Justice Science, and this is H.R. 2515. And this, this amendment prohibits the funds from the Department of Justice to contravene the Section 7606. So this one was in place. And there are other amendments that are being adopted right now, and we'll see how these amendments play out in the long run if they're actually going all the way through. And part of these amendments are about the, the use, the distribution, and the possession of this material when it's cultivated, and then being able to move that material from one to another. In addition, there's an amendment to prohibit the use of funds to take any action to prevent states from implementing laws surrounding cannabidiol oil. So very interesting legislative action happening in the U.S. Next. 
So here we have a map of the 2015 hemp legislation. So as you can see, there are 25 states that have a law that would function underneath Section 7606 of the Farm Bill. Thus, 25 states are allowed, if they have the rules in place, to actually cultivate industrial hemp. As you can see from this map, you can see where the stars are at. In each one of those states, we do have hemp research. So in 2015, we had hemp research happening in Kentucky, Colorado, Tennessee, North Dakota, Indiana, Hawaii, Vermont, and Oregon. And so to talk a little bit more about those research projects, next. Here's a photo of the University of Kentucky, and this is Dr. David Williams, and these are the research trials there. They have over 20 different cultivars that they are trialing at the University of Kentucky. Not to mind the project happening at the University of Kentucky, but you also have multiple projects happening on farm. So in Kentucky, they have opened up for producers to come on and actually get their license through the state and in relationship with the state ag department to do on farm research also. This is Dr. David Williams at the University of Kentucky. Next. Another project is happening at Middle Tennessee State University by a young man by the name of Clint Palmer. Clint has not only greenhouse project, but also a field trial. In Clint's project, he had a lot of Johnson grass that came, so they had to spend a lot of time pulling the Johnson grass in the field. This was a bit due to late seeding um, from late entry of the planting seed, but next year they'll work out the entry date so they know that they've got the seed in place in Tennessee prior to planting. Next. Here's a couple pictures from the University of Hawaii. This is also Australian cultivar. Next. A project I'm particularly proud of is this project here at North Dakota State University. Working in conjunction with Dr. Burton Johnson, I was a key player in bringing in all of the planting seed for this cultivar trial. There was 12 varieties. Those came five from Canada, six from France, and one from Australia. All of the varieties are doing quite well. We would expect the Canadian cultivars to do well as this research plot is only about 12 to 15, 20, 20 kilometers south of the Canadian border. And as you can see here, I'm standing with uh, Dr. David Williams in white, and we're standing in front of the uh, French cultivars. Next. So just to look at the U.S. hemp market for 2014, we saw over, you know, the Hemp Industries Association estimates $620 million worth of sales. These are increases of up to, you know, 26% increase in conventional retailers, a 21% increase in the body, the overall foods and body care industry. So this kind of 20% growth is really good as it shows that we have a strong marketplace people are recognizing the products people are buying the products and this is carrying over into the spins data and this is where these numbers come from this data looks at retailers and then brings this data in so that we can get these types of percentages to show the rate of the marketplace next these products of course as we well know vary from lotions to beers next into the housing industry. Next. One of the things I'd like to also invite everybody to share is Oregon State University is offering WSC 266 on industrial hemp. This is a course, three credit hour course, solely focused on him. It is an e-campus online course. I would encourage everybody to check this class out. I was able to bring together Steve Allen, Dr. Chad Alvin, 
Richard Pranas, Dr. George Weblin, a lot of people that I respect within the industry and researchers to present the material that's presented in this course in that WSC 266. Next. I'm also part of the Hemp Industry Association. I am the current president. We are a nonprofit in the United States and, and love to have the opportunity to work with our global community, such as everybody listening in and World Hemp Congress. Thank you for all your support and, and promoting and sharing the work of the Hemp Industries Association. Part of that work is next is our lobby day. Um, so this is a couple years back in Washington, D.C. So we all come together for our national conference and have said lobby days or different types of actions. And now that we've got the cultivation and industrial hemp in the U.S. underneath Section 7606, this provides us opportunity to start going to those states and really using the action that's happening as a strong message about how we can be cultivating hemp in the United States. And one of the activities the Hemp Industry Association has is 18. Uh, next slide is Hemp History Week. This is the nationwide education campaign and marketing program that seeks to renew strong support for hemp farming in the U.S. And really, we could have a global Hemp History Week where we all come together around the globe to celebrate our hemp history. So we definitely invite you to, to check out our hemphistoryweek.com. The event was has passed. It was June 1st through 7th. And we'll look forward to the 7th annual Hemp History Week next year. So please get involved around the globe and help supporting Hemp History Week, not only in the U.S., but in where you're from. Next. We would like to extend an invitation to our global community here um, to attend the Hemp Industries Association's National Conference coming up in Lexington, Kentucky. We'll have a field tour. There's going to be uh, all kinds of great lectures. There's going to be a great trade show. I so want to just give a big shout out to our Kentucky State Chapter and all of the other state chapters of the Hemp Industry Association and our national board and all of our members. And so on behalf of all of them, please welcome to our conference in Lexington, Kentucky. And you can check us out at thehia.org. Next. So now I'd like to switch just to talk briefly about the Canadian regulations. Um, these regulations are SOR 93156. Part of those is a list of approved cultivars, which I'm going to talk on in just a little bit as we start to discuss pedigree seed production. So these are a bit of the regulations. As, as most of you know, we're based on 0.3%. Unlike in the EU, it's 0.2%. But we are right now underneath a regulatory review. Next. So the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance in December of 2013 has called the Canadian government to deregulate the production and processing and export of industrial hemp. Part of these key factors looked at licensing, THC analysis, the licensing for cultivation, importation, deregulizing, deregulizing, de uh, minimizing um, and deregulation control, and to look at how the licensing and permitting, volunteer seating, and other interpretations of our hemp regulations actually come into play. We're in addition to asking us to be transferred to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Next. So part of that is ongoing relationship between Health Canada, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance to talk about how do we continue watching the developments and how do we stay relatively low on the priority? This is, we're relatively low on the priority list for Health Canada. So how do we increase our priority listing? And the overreaching point is that the industry wants deregulation and that it's the point where we continue to reinforce with whomever we're communicating. So the board and the executive director of the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance are continuously in communication. And at this year's conference, we will be having Health Canada session, session to discuss issues or opportunities that we have to streamline our regulations. Next. So this is looking at last year's license and through 2014. 
we had over 1,100 license granted, and we had over uh, um, 43,000 hectares planted. This year, we're ex upward of the around 60,000 60, hectares. Um, and in last year alone, that was 67% increase in our production area, with the majority of that 67% increase in 20, between 2013 and 2014 was due to our, our increase in the market. As I spoke earlier, we had 20%, over 20% increase in the marketplace. So we need to have that increase to be able to supply into that global market. Next. This is a busy slide. I just want to point out that most of the exports coming out of Canada are going into the United States. In 2014 alone, of the $47.9 million in exports, $42 million was uh, exported into the United States. So it's a major market. So this is a really big opportunity as we start to discuss the cultivation of industrial hemp in the United States and how there is a demand for hemp in the U.S. and around the globe and how this will be driving that legislative change by talking about the marketplace. Next. So these ones look at fibers. As most of you may know, in Canada, we do not have commercial scale fiber decortication facilities. So our fiber market is very small. So we do rely on our colleagues in the EU to be supplying those herd and fiber products to us and our colleagues in China to be supplying the textiles. Next. So in 2015, the Canadian list of approved cultivars contained 44 cultivars. And in 2014, there was a 39 cultivars. So six new cultivars were added to the Canadian cultivar list. Those are Ganma, Piccolo, Grandi, Catani, Georgina, and Victoria. Phenolic is continued to be on the watch list as it tends to spike in THC. Not too much, but as you can see from the 2013 stats that I have here, of 87 samples, nine of those were over 0.3% THC. Now, if they are test over, then they'll come back and look at what is, then they'll retest the grain or, or rerun the, the the plant material sample. There are 14 exemptions for THC. Seven cultivars are exempt across Canada. Eight are exempt regionally. And these means cultivars that are for over three, peer, three years are less or equal to 0.15% THC than they are exempt from a commercial level THC test. Next. And on behalf of the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance, Conference Committee, the board, and all of the CHTA members, we would like to invite you to attend our conference coming up in Calgary, Alberta in November. It's a four-day event. We also are going to be having the Campfire Jam Night, so there will be instruments around to sing your favorite songs. And we will also, in addition, be having a session with Health Canada to discuss how the regulatory change will impact our industry as we move forward and how we can streamline that. So please check out hemptrade.ca if you're interested in attending the conference. Uh, please let us know. There will be a great trade show and we'd love to showcase your products. Next. So I want to talk briefly on pedigree seed production. And pedigree seed is genetically pure or known variety and developed with unique characteristics. And this term pedigree means that the ancestry of the seed can be traced back to the plant breeder that developed, developed it and ensures the quality parameters that we're going to need so that we get the end crop performance that we're looking for. Next. So in the pedigree seed authorities, in Canada, as I said, all varieties must be of pedigree status, and that comes in under the member of the Association of the Official Seed Certification Agency, AOSCA. And in the Canadian agencies that are part of the association, the official seed certifying agencies are the Canadian Seed Growers Association, which is regulated underneath our seed regulations. 
and under the Canadian Food Inspection Agency that actually inspects underneath the Seeds Act and regulations and are administered under the authorities of the OECD seed schemes um, under the Canadian regulations. Next. So the Association for official seed certifying agencies in June of 2014, using the Canadian standard as a guide, wrote a draft to approve standards that may be used in the U.S. and believes that these new standards will be useful as part of the overall regulatory framework to be developed. And these included, are not, not inclusive to, but included uh, seed classes and generations, uh, foundation plot production, land requirements, uh, crop inspections, and foundation seed standards. Uh, the link is here, so you are welcome to download this PDF straight from the Seed Certifying um, Association's website. Next. And part of these regulations determine the minimum isolation distances required between different types of industrial hemp or different pedigree levels and also other crops. So looking here, some of those are up to 5,000 meters, some 5 meters. Um, so a breeder plot of the same variety only needs to have an isolation of 5 meters between those two plots, for instance. In addition, it also looks at the minimum purity standards or impurity standards. So when the inspector goes into the field, they're looking for different standards of purity to be able to judge whether or not that cultivar is within the right pedigree status and has been maintained and roped properly. Once again, you can find all of these on the official seed certifying website, so Association of the Official Seed Certifying Agencies. You can download this PDF from this June 14 draft that they put forward based on the Canadian regulations. So just to hit briefly about agronomy, you know what, if we wouldn't have the, the farmers, so just want to give a big thanks to all the farmers out there and all the people working with the producers to encourage the cultivation of hemp. So thank you so much. Just to give a brief about agronomy here, I mean, of course, we've got to have the field and the right cultivars. That's really key as we start to look at research, not only in the U.S., the continued research in Europe and in Canada and in China, but as we start to help all of our partners around the world talk about cultivars and get access to these types of cultivars, of course, we want to respect plant breeders' rights. And so once we've got those varieties in the ground and we can examine and figure out which cultivars are going to work best for what kind of cropping rotations that we're wanting to work at, or what kind of product that we want to get off at the end of the day. You know, we're looking at the sowing, we're looking at fertilization, and how do we deal with the weed and disease and insect control? And then of course, harvesting and drying and storage, our final step there, harvesting, drying and storage is so key to make sure that we're keeping the integrity of the product intact. Next. So looking at some of the Canadian uh, growing conditions not to avoid wet soil, it does like the soil to be warm. Uh, when you're talking about, you know, the seeding rate, that really depends on what type of cultivation. And now that we're looking at the type of industrial hemp cultivation is growing so much, we're not only focusing on how do we get grain and fiber. So now we're looking at all of the other constituents. And so these, these general observations are based in Canada that I'm presenting principally looking at the food production side, but no matter what, you need to make sure that you've got the proper crop rotation and definitely fertilizers and making sure that all of your regulations are in place. Next. So we're just about finished. So this is talking about food handling. This is really important, to, you know, as we start to look at, you know, new industries coming on and new producers coming on and how do we handle the, the grain particular so we know that we're delivering a healthy food product to the, the consumers. So this all comes down to certifying the certifications, the field handling, back to the storage, your cleaning, and then looking at the processing flow, of course, all your certificate of analysis, and then at the end of the day, your packaging. So I so said one of those key things next, so we're on slide 34. 
um, is the primary production, harvesting, drying, and storage. Once again, these are so important as you want to make sure that the moisture content is kept relatively low around that eight or nine percent and you're preventing any heating crusting in that bed so that you make sure that you're constantly monitoring your grain so that it doesn't become unstable. And this is not only for just grain, but also for planting seed. You want to make sure that you, you definitely keep this um, so that it is completely intact and, and viable. Next. So here's an example of a hemp grain food production flowchart. Once again, everything in this flowchart points back to certification and preparing for market. So just want to make sure through the entire process that the certifications are all in place. And this is all the way down to, to be able to create that certificate of analysis and running a HACCP certified facility. Next. So just want to thank everybody for your time. And I'd love to hear your general thoughts and other topics that you would like uh, to speak with me about. And I'd definitely like to invite everybody to come on my radio show, iHemp Radio. It gives me an opportunity to share with uh, the world your hemp dreams and how we can all help make those a reality. Next. So thank you so much. Uh, to the World Hemp Congress team and your delegates, uh, colleagues, and friends. And I see I have a typo there. Um, once again, my name is Andrea Herman. Please reach out to me, theridgeconsulting at gmail.com. Also, check out the Hemp Industries Association, Hemp Technologies. Ch check out what's happening at Oregon State University Hemp, um, and the Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance. Next. So, you know where you'll find me in a hemp field somewhere around the globe. So I just want to say thank you so much and open to any questions. Thank you very much, and Andrea, too. Uh, I know that this, uh, so applause. I know that uh, we call you early in the morning in Canada. And uh, uh, so I have a first question for you. How is with technology in uh, Canada and the United States? Uh, uh, we are uh, in, uh, very primitive level here in uh, Europe. Uh, in some countries, uh, it's just a little bit better, like uh, here in Slovenia. But uh, how is with uh, technology parts for 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 hemp uh, industry? Is this uh, in fast growing, or you have some modern stuff? How is this working on? Absolutely. We're seeing all types of new technologies coming on right now. I mean, if you look at everything, that the research that's happening, for instance, from nanotechnologies to the graphene, which I'm sure lots of people have been investigated. But in addition, the, the, the continued realization of all of the products that we can get from industrial hemp. So you look at Dr. Chad Alvin's projects, looking at hemp is a composite product. And I think that that's where in the United States and in North America, we'll see a lot of forward advancements as we start to really get involved in the fiber processing and, and the plant breeding. So a lot of room to move forward when it comes to technology. So, and products, you can talk about uh, some uh, products. How is it uh, new products? Is this... Uh some innovation in growing on, or how is this? We lose you, you see us? So? Yes, hello. Yes, how is with uh, innovations there uh, about products, hemp products? Is this yeah, I think when we start to look at some pretty interesting hemp products out there, and uh, there's a really great, um, I know that Satori Wheels is doing a project looking at skateboard wheels. There's a great uh, company making hemp instruments, uh, hemp guitars and hemp ukuleles. So those are very interesting uh, products. And also, you know, in addition to a, a lot of, um, you know, the economy of scale producers that are coming on right now as we start to look at the cultivation in the United States and small farming groups and driving people back to the farm. So we're going to be seeing a lot of in innovation coming from these individual groups learning how to cultivate with the machinery that they have. So we're going to see a lot of on-farm innovation when it comes to using uh, equipment that's based in the United States. 
Wonderful. And uh, who support you? Uh, have you maybe government money or uh, how, uh, who support uh, researchers in the uh, United States and Canada? Is this is, this is uh, private money or business uh, uh, angels money or is it just, uh, just government money? How is this working? Right. Or, the or research is, Just a second. Is, uh, okay. And uh, if is there are some problems with the government money for him? Right now in um, Canada, the funding for the research projects are government funded, provincial, both federal and provincial, plus private industry funding with matching dollars. So thankfully in Canada, we do get some government support to conduct the research that needs to be done, continue variety trials. If we look at the research coming out of the Alberta Innovates Group, so th that is really key to the forward movement in Canada. Now in the U.S., it has been mostly private and some institutional funding put forward. Some states have provided some funding, but it's been very, very limited. So most of what's happening in the United States has been in-kind contribution and um, you know, people just providing donations so that projects can get complete. So then we, 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 we can make it the green line or red line and that we need uh, government money and uh, uh, we must ask government that uh, they open the door to this money, that this money will come inside too. So I will take a uh, microphone to audience. I see some questions here for you. It's just a second. Okay, Dr. Herman, thank you very much for your time and your comprehensive briefing. It was fantastic, and I'm, I'm sorry it's uh, so rare that we get such a, a hip expert uh, on board. Do I say it? Oh. No, go ahead. Okay, sorry. Um, I was gonna. I, I'm being a being an Oregon resident myself. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, are there is there any pushback from the legal marijuana industry uh, against the hemp industry, and uh, is there is there uh, policies that you're attempting to put in place in Oregon that could protect the two? Because I think they're both kind of, uh, they're separate, but they're they're both very beneficial for the state. Mm -hmm. uh, hello. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. I have been, you know, one of the questions is, is there a risk to marijuana growers when you've got hemp production in the area? Yes, there is because of that male pollen. We do, we have seen a pushback in Oregon and also like in Washington state as it comes to this issue and how to to deal with this so that we can have the cultivation of hemp and the cultivation of marijuana kind of happen simultaneously. Part of that would be implementing, you know, said things as pedigree seed production so that we have some sort of isolation. There was a report published um, actually by somebody, I have to, I forget his name, I'll, I'll, I will share that, um, that looked at the pollinization and, you know, some of that research showed anywhere between you know, seven to 30 miles where pollen could be contaminative um, to the marijuana. So yes, it, it is an issue. I call it the natural cannabis cultural clash. And, uh, the, and these things are being worked out in states such as Oregon. Thank you very much. And, and I'm sorry, if I could just add a, a follow-up question. Uh, one of the big um, issues for, for hemp is really the education and the study of the plant on, on all levels. It, are you at the point right now to do cross-border uh, studies between, say, Oregon State University and, and universities within Canada? And are you at the point where we can begin studying across the Atlantic? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you look at, just like the project I was speaking about, about North Dakota State University, that project has been set up to really mirror the variety of trials that have happened in Canada. So that data, you can go, a really great, <clears throat> pardon me, for agronomic data is through the Parkland Crop Diversification Foundation. 
based in Roblin, Manitoba. They have all of their PDFs online, and that looks at basic agronomic research. So absolutely, the plant breeders are keen to provide planting seed, um, of course, with all of the proper documentation, material transfer agreements, and all um, MOUs understanding, um, you know, to protect the plant breeder, and so that you know that the genetics are staying true. So absolutely, there is opportunity. Part of the issue comes forward is some universities are fearful because that we only have section 7606 and the Controlled Substance Act hasn't been changed to remove hemp from the definition of marijuana. Um, so it's going to be very interesting and, and that's part of some of the university's fears is will they risk losing federal money if they try to push a hemp agenda? Hi, Andrea. Um, yes. I had some question about hemp food. Um, if you could tell us what do you think about the future of, of hemp food market in the United States and Europe. Also, especially if you can talk about what you think about hemp milk. And, hemp uh, milk? Hemp milk. Okay. Um, well, I know when, as Daniel was saying, we, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very switch. So if we look at the, the market in Europe, it's mostly a fiber based market, but they have a growing food industry happening. So we need that hemp education definitely in Europe to educate about the use of hemp foods and start incorporating those in into the diet so that we can start to drive that market in the EU. In the United States, I see the hemp food market growing. We're starting to see more regional brands, which is really strong in driving the local hemp food market. So more regional brands are coming on. So you're starting to see these. Um, you know, in help with education campaigns like the Hemp History Week, starting to see those brand placements. So we've got a lot of room to still move. Um, one of the limitations on entry into the large commercial food market is hemp is not grass in the United States, which means it generally recognized as safe. This is grass, so all kinds of different products um, get grass. Those are by either research that is conducted or historical knowledge of the consumption of this product. So if you want to get in the United States, if you want to get hemp into a product that is owned by Kellogg's, for instance, or Nabisco's of the world, you have to have um, your products be grass or, or grass recognized. So th those are some of the limitations that we have in the United States of going mainstream but, um, in the sense of going into large commercial products, but there's so room to so much room to grow on that regional sales. So um, and very much of an increase when it comes to the hemp in the United States and globally uh, as a food product. And the last question was about uh, hemp milk or beverages and uh, non-dairy beverages. Um, I had some this morning, right, in my hemp smoothie, or, or yesterday morning, I will this morning. Um, I definitely see a marketplace for that. It's, it's competitive when you start just to look at the nutritional profile. So if you just compare the nutritional profiles, there is a benefit to using um, a, a hemp as a non-dairy beverage, yes. And what would be your, your advice for a new company starting in a hemp food brand? Well, I say, you know, focus on, you know, or do you want to be a bar company? Do you want to just sell a bag of hauled hemp? Um, you know, really, what is your what is your market focus is really important. So I say, you know, try to hone in on a few different products instead of trying to do a mass line. Um, really figure out what you do best when it comes to what your desire is as a food product. Do you want to launch a protein powder, for instance? So really focus on a few key products in the protein powder division um, and, then, and then help develop as, as your brand start to grow, bring on more products. And definitely make sure that, you know, you're tasting these products and that you're making sure that they come along with all, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, all of the proper certifications. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hi, uh, Andrea. Um, nice to uh, see your talk. I uh, just got a quick question, which is, 
with regards to um, products ranging from cosmetics to food products. I've seen quite a few in the US uh, which uh, got um, CBD in them and obviously they're not going to be recognized or reg uh, regulated by the uh, USDA. So what is your, what is the situation with regards to that because um, people are buying those products for themselves um, using them but they're not recognized and if one wants to import those products most of which are being made in the US uh, if they want to import them to other countries CBD products then what would be the situation I don't know what it is the situation for importing from these countries but if you've got any insight that would be great yeah it, it's I'll definitely say that as we start to talk about CBD particularly and cannabinoids in the U.S., it's a very gray area. We have had the FDA has brought forward a ruling saying that CBD cannot be listed as a dietary supplement as it's not registered with the FDA, further stating that will the FDA um, it, come after or uh, um, put forth a penalty to companies, they said based on the threat. So we definitely know the FDA has come forward and saying CBD in the U.S. is not a dietary supplement. Um, but now the question comes, is naturally occurring cannabinoids? Um, can we market a body care product based on that? We do not have a definite ruling based on a free-for-sale product. Some states have put forward their own legislation um, legalizing CBD and other cannabinoids. So how does that protect um, states' rights versus the federal government? In addition, they have come forward saying that underneath Section 7606, it does not um, allow you to take and create a Schedule One drug from industrial hemp. So essentially, if CBD is still listed, then it's not allowed underneath Section 7606. However, when you see the overall forward movement of cannabis legislation in the United States, it's a very, very gray area. Um, and I know that there's going to be some other presenters that are going to specifically be talking about this issue. Um, so definitely just stay tuned to the other presentations that are going to really be honing in on the issue of CBD in the U.S. But there, it's definitely a, a gray area. Okay, just one last thing. I hope to sign up to your course online in January. So I look forward to engaging with you more. Thanks very much. Absolutely. It'll be interesting. Hello, uh, my name is Al Alexandros from the uh, company Canopy. We are trying to build a, a testing lab uh, facility here in Europe. And I would like to ask you regarding the certification you mentioned in uh, North America, US or Canada, is it this, the testing methods have been certified? There is any standardization on what the, each product should be incorporated inside their uh, analysis? Uh, does the, the government, U.S. government or Canada government, has done any policies regarding the, start, uh, the testing of these products? And, and you were saying a, a food facility, correct? Uh, I, I would say also, it would go also on the food facility, yes. A food facility. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are, you know, when you start to look at food standards, these would fall in a line with any general food standards that are put forward by government. So the amount of E. coli that you can have in a product, for instance, which is none, or yolk molds and yeast. Typically, these types of basic food standards are regulated. And so there's not a set standard per se from the hemp industries when it comes to what has to be on a certificate of analysis but most of the time those are pretty basic so if you're running a certificate of analysis on um, flax oil it would be the very same analysis that you would be running on uh, a hemp seed oil
Thank you. So those are basic food standard parameters. Good morning, Dr. Herrera. Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, the building side of, uh, of Hamburg, let's say. So you mentioned that in Canada there's no processing facility. Do you? Not the yeah, so in no? Canada we do not have any, com we do not have a commercial scale decortication facility yet in Canada. We have some, some pilot facilities um, and some facilities that are planned. So it's part, it's part of an opportunity um, in Canada is to build a fiber decortication facility. And right now, um, like my company, Hem Technologies, we're working with uh, Danagro and bringing in from the Netherlands and other fiber suppliers to be able to supply the, the herd and binder um, for hempcrete and other types of construction projects. Yeah, because considering that uh, if you import sheaves for hempcrete or whatever, uh, across the ocean, it uh, would carry a lot of uh, embodied energy whatsoever, so it would be by far not sustainable. And uh, on the other hand, uh, considering that uh, maybe an, an average hectare yields six, eight tons of straw, uh, it, it's uh, on the other hand, it's a, it's a big waste. So what, what you do currently with all the, the straw that is not used? Well, the varieties that are being grown principally in Canada are shorter stature cultivars, so they're not, um, they're getting maybe, you know, a meter and a half, two meters tall, um, maybe about, yeah, maybe two meters tall, um, so the cultivars are relatively short in stature, so when you're done harvesting the grain, there's very little fiber left over or straw in field. Um, enough to sometimes still bail, but if you look at cultivars like vanola, you know, it's only going to be um, a meter plus tall, so there's not going to be any straw really left over. So I think there's no question anymore. I don't have one. I don't have one. Hi, Daniel. I just wanted to say hello. Hi, Andrea. I know that voice from anywhere. <laughs> see, you, see you in November at the CHGA convention. For sure, hugs then. Bye. What's your question, Daniel? No question for now. <laughs> Any more questions? No one? All right. Thank you very much. Andrea, thank you very much, Canada. Thank you very much, United States, for now. So, stay with us, maybe go sleep for some hour and then come back again. And uh, thank you, Andrea. Stay in world, stay in world of hemp and be strong like you are and uh, change the world. Bye bye and uh, see you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So, uh, in Green Hemp Speaker's Room, we go in another uh, speech. We will take uh, minutes of break, uh, minute or two breaks, and then we started with uh, next speaker from uh, Croatia. Um, uh, Mr. Carlo Kukac will uh, talk about importance of hemp in innovation and global green economy. Thank you very much, and see us.